You from the city of McCray? Yes. And are, are, are you a native? I always like to ask people a little uh, bit about their background. Are you a... Yes, I'm a native of Fair County, County okay. McCray. Maybe you could tell a little bit about your background, your education, you know, then what you did, and then before you got into this whole area. Well, I was, came from a large family of 12 children. My parents were Mr. and Mrs. T.L. Ashford. I mean, I was reared on a farm. Okay. I married, and I'm the mother of four children, and I reared two of my sister's children. Okay. And I attended Fort Valley State College, Fort Valley, Georgia, and I have majors in uh, mathematics and science. And I'm presently employed by the Tefal County Board of Education, and this is my 29th year that I'm teaching. Okay. So you started um, around 1960? That's right. Okay, and that was right after graduating from Fort Allen? That's correct. Had either of your parents any sort of interest in, in either uh, voting or politics or? No. Okay. Because in their times they really, uh, the white race really didn't want black people to be involved. Okay. <laughs> And so at that particular time, you know, they just really didn't get involved because they didn't want to make uh, disturbance among the whites. And so, you know, they sort of stayed in line so that they could be on good terms with their white neighbors and what have you. So whatever happened to black people, they, they would just take it and that was it. As far as you know, had there been any efforts to register voters in the years before the 1960s? No. In essence, no black registration before that time. That's right. And how you came back home in 1960 as a that teacher. Was, that's right. And then um, how did you begin to get involved or other people get involved in the whole area of politics and voting? Well, it just worried me to see that you had so much uh, in a small time that you had some, a few people were the power structure and then there were quite a few young people that were and you know I said does that were registered to become voters so then if they weren't registered to become voters they didn't have any choice in who was being elected to serve us in the county and I really got concerned because we had this power structure that whenever the election was held, they would always get elected back to office, and they had that little game that they used to run the county, run the city. So I felt that by getting some of the minorities uh, registered, that this could sort of help determine uh, when voting to get some people elected that we thought uh, probably would be fair to all people, not just only blacks, but you know, to all people. Right. When did you first register yourself or vote yourself? Oh, it must have been, it probably was about 1960. Okay, did you have any trouble yourself or what was your experience? Well, I had to, I had to read and I had to write a, a script. They gave us something to write on and they told us if they if you couldn't write well enough you know to understand for us to understand that of their uh they understand our handwriting that would be one of the things that we would be disqualified and they gave us a passage of uh, something from the constitution a georgia constitution it might have been u.s constitution to read and if we couldn't read that properly then that would be grounds for us not to become registered voters when I first had gone down to register. But then later on, we made complaints because there were some blacks that could not read and they couldn't write and we made complaints. And uh, so they finally got rid of that. Uh, it might've been just a little earlier than 60. Okay, do you go down by yourself or were, were you with other people? Well, I contacted at that time, uh, Miss Ruby Hurley uh -huh. was our uh, uh, state NAACP right. president. And I contacted her, and she she was the one that you know looked into it. So for some reason, they abolished this uh, rule they had that you would have to 
read and write uh, in order to become registered voters. Okay, now, you know, at that time, how many registered voters, black registered voters, would you say there were in that in oh, the county and the city? You probably had about, probably, you probably about 25 or 30. And your efforts start a little bit later than that. Maybe That's in the right. the early 60s you're talking about. That's right. Like that. And then what did either you or other people do at that time to try to get people to actually register? Well, you know, upon attending the NAACP meetings and talking with Mrs. Hurley, uh, she, you know, told us that they really couldn't hold that against us. So when they find out that they will have to stop, then this is when I went out in, in the community and I went to all sections of the community and to the churches and I started encouraging the black people to, you know, go out and get registered and I tried to emphasize the importance of becoming registered voters. Was this you by yourself or part of an organization well, or uh, Well no at at the beginning I just started out by myself, you know, I would just go out to the churches and try to encourage the uh, black people to go out and get registered. Then I start taking a lot of them. Okay, okay, but pretty much, yeah, pretty much an individual effort, really. Yeah. Methodology. You used to be calling out, you were calling out, which, yeah, about Miss Ship. Miss Ship? Who is Miss Ship? Oh, uh, it's a lady that used to live in McCray. Okay, and what was the story with her? Well, she just got involved with working with the young people in the NAACP. Okay, okay. Now, what kind of opposition or reaction did you have when you would go to the churches, go out in the community? What kind of response did you have from people about voting? Well, there are a lot of them that was in favor of uh, voting, you know, getting registered, but then they were afraid. And, you know, and I just kept telling them that uh, they need not be afraid, you know, that this was something that was going to have to come, and so they just might as well go ahead, and I told them, I said, the more we have registered, and the more go out to the polls and vote, then they will begin to see that we are really uh, are planning to uh, get something accomplished. So, you know, when we first started, used to go out to the polls where I had to go vote. There were only... Uh, three blacks voting in that area. It was a little voting place out in the community, out in the rural area. And when you go to the polls, it was a paper ballot, and you have all these white people standing around the polls. And you know, when you walked in to vote, you know, you didn't feel too secure because they was wondering, were you coming out to vote against somebody running against that little gang? And so, you know, you really didn't feel too uh, sure of going in safe when you were going into boat. Okay. It was a little house, you know, a little old house by, by half large as this room. And this is where you would go in and they had paper ballots. And so when you pull up, you, you that was all day, you know, you had all these whites standing around. So when you go through the line, you know, they'd be giving you bad eyes because they just wonder if you're going to vote for, the, for their candidate. So that was, uh, you're saying, that kept people away? That's right. When you talk about fear, what other kinds of things are you talking about? Well, then we had this uh, policy wherein, you know, they would just almost demand black people who they had to vote for. You know, you would, long then you didn't have any black candidates, and they all were white. But then, you know, you had a lot of these blacks living on the white people places and what have you. So. Whoever they tell you to vote for, you know, it was a must that that's who you had to vote for. And this is what my daddy knows instilled in me. Well, my daddy had his own farm, but some of the leading whites in that particular area would always direct him who to vote for. So he felt that because I was his daughter, I had to vote like those white people told him to vote. Right. And, you know, we used to have differences because I told him that you have your right to vote for who you want to and I have my right. But we used to have some stiff arguments because that was instilled in the older people, black people mind that they had to do this. And so that's what was handed down from the years. And then when they uh, this started allowing them to rest and vote, uh, this is what they had to do. Where would the registration places be? Okay, we had to go to the courthouse in McCray. Everybody at that time had to go to the county courthouse to register. Excellent. And uh, 
explain what that meant to people too, what the courthouse meant. Oh, uh, you know, that this was a place that you had to go and get registered. This was the kind of courthouse, this was a registration site. And uh, also when you go up to get registered, you know, they still have this little political power group standing around to see what blacks was coming in to register. You know, they're here, like sometimes you go up to register and they will tell you, tell you to come back another day. So then when you get back, they have gotten the word around and you will have this political power of whites are standing around to see, you know, what black coming in here to register now. And you really didn't feel safe, you know, of even going out to register. And that's why you started to take groups of people. That's right. I started taking carloads. I started going around getting them up, and I'd take a carload at one time. So they felt sort of secure, like, you know, that I was going to go along with them. And then I felt more secure by taking five or six or seven sometimes. I said, well, if they start at, you know, if they get behind us, I have more than one person, you know, to be at my side. I think people, you know, it's only 25, 30 years later, but I think people today have a hard time understanding the element of fear that actually was involved right then. That's right. Still there? Okay. So this is in the days, though, you're talking about there are a handful or a couple of dozen people registered when you came back, and then how did the numbers go up from that point? Okay, well, when I really got them to get involved, we had a, we wanted to get, uh, uh, we wanted to get a, a law pay, well, I said, I guess, uh, we wanted to get a pass to get some blacks on the Board of Education. Okay. So they had a referendum. They said they would increase the school board if the referendum passed, and if it passed, that they would put on two blanks. So at that time, I was very much concerned because, you know, I was teaching school and I yeah. felt that we needed some blacks on the Board of Education after getting involved in, well, I was teaching in Ben Hill County. Okay. And uh, so I felt that uh, we needed some blacks on the school board because of, you know, we had black teachers in the school system, black students having problems, and that if we would have some blacks on the board of education, that would be helpful, you know, probably help solving some of our problems. This was still a segregated school system, though, right? That's right, it was a segregated right. school system. So this is what they, the rule they made that if this referendum pays, let the people decide whether they want to increase the school board, and if it pays, that they would guarantee us two blanks. So I went out and I got people registered. And then on the date that the election was held, uh, I had one car and my son had another car. And we hauled something like about 150, about 160 people to the poll. Okay, so the whites didn't think that it was gonna pass. And they stayed home. Because they just, you know, they knew that black people hadn't been uh, voting just but a very few. So we carried all these people to the poll and then out in the other uh, areas of the county, the other polling places, uh, where we had started voting in McCray, they had, they had gotten rid of the little place out in the country. And so we start, we all had to go to the county courthouse to vote. So we carried all these people up and round about just for closing time. The word got around to the whites that I had brought all these people in to vote. So then they started coming in, but it was too late in the in the be you know the uh, referendum passed. So after it passed, then they had to put two blacks on. But what happened is that we submitted names of blacks that we wanted them to pick from, but they didn't use the blacks that we wanted. They handpicked them two blacks, and one of them was my father that they knew that they could handle because they knew how they had always handled my father and they told him that you know whatever they tell him you know he had to do what they said or go like they wanted him to so that's who they picked and you know I didn't submit his name because I knew how he was but this is who they appointed. Well how did that agreement actually get worked out you know the agreement to put on to if the referendum passed? Well we 
we had a meeting with the whites. The we is who is the we? Well, I went. Uh, we were from our NAACP oh, branch. Oh, it was I a chapter. Voters League. That. That's right. Voters uh, League. Okay. That's right. I think we went through the Voters League or okay, the NAACP. Voters League. But right. we just had a, a group to small group to go in and talk with them, and we told them that we saw the need for some blacks to be on the board of education. And so then this is when they made that agreement, but they didn't think it was going to pass. So as soon as they made the agreement, I started registering the people. And they just, you know, assumed that when well, she carried them up there and got them registered, but then they're not coming back to the polls to vote, but I pulled them there. Right. I went to door to door and I knocked on doors that morning. And I pulled a lot of them out. They told me, well, you know, well, we're afraid to go. I said, well, no, don't be afraid this morning. I'm with you. I'm going to stand by you. And that was, was shocking. I carried all those people up there, and we had enough votes to pass it. So then they couldn't back off because they had made a, you know, an agreement that this would happen. Can you describe what you felt that day? Oh, I was just, I was just, just so happy. Until I really couldn't explain how happy I was. I had, <laughs> what you call, blisters on my feet. I ran around so much that day all day getting people to the polls and what happened my feet were so sore that night I couldn't hardly sleep. Oh, a lot of first time That's right. voters. And so from then on then the whites start watching me. Now what was that date you're talking about that election day? Uh, I can't think of it. Not right off hand. 60s? Yes it was in the it was in the 60s because I you know it was in the early 60s because early I was still working. Before Voting Rights Act or? You're, I just can't remember now, but I knew but you I were was, still working at Ben Hill. Yeah, I was still working in Ben Hill County. Cause see, if I had been working in Telfair, I could have even gotten involved. <laughs> and when did you move back to Telfair to teach in the Telfair schools? Oh, I started in Telfair in '69. So, so this before that before. time, okay. that's right. Okay, and so that was the key key election. Was this first? bond referendum, school That's bond right. re referendum. But then you're saying that the school board in turn turned around and they picked two But well, they had well, picked the blacks that they wanted to serve, you know. And one of them was your father. Right? That's right. And uh, Mr. E.C. Graham, you know, they was that yes, yes mm -hmm, mm -hmm, people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the name that the person that we wanted to serve, they wouldn't they wouldn't use old right. people. They uh, hand picked who they wanted to serve. What was that now? No, what happened, we submit names to the grand jury because they, the grand jury was going to pick them. But um, we submitted a name to the grand jury and, and the grand jury didn't pick any of the names that we submitted. They, uh, you know, picked my father's name, T.L. Ashford and uh, E.C. Graham. Okay. How was the grand jury composed at that time? How did they pick the grand jury? Was it from well, property owners or voters? Or? Well, they were saying from uh, uh, property owners, I believe. Okay. You had at that time you did you had to own property to be selected on the grand jury, but it was all whites. Right. At that time, they didn't let blacks uh, serve on the grand jury. jury. Now, what was your response to when they went to when they picked these two? Who you didn't want? Well, I let them know that you know we weren't uh, that we weren't uh, satisfied, but you know they made that decision, so it really was nothing that we could do about it at that time. Okay, then, then sort of where's the next step, the next stage after that? You've okay, gotten so, some people to the polls and done some registration. So then, uh, so they they served. You know, because they was appointed by the grand jury, and until the grand jury see need to replace them, and the present whites that were serving, they just always remain. You know, no matter what, if they were doing good or bad, that was. That was all appointed by the grand right. jury. That's right. So they remain there until the grand jury uh, decide that they want to make a change. So then later on, we made complaints because we had a lot of you know. You know, the white and the black serving, we didn't think that they was giving us good service. So then this is when they uh, went to the, we went to our state representative. I was talking with our state representative at the time, who, who Ronnie was, Walker. Who, who was it? Ronnie Walker. Ronnie Walker, okay. And so we decided that we felt it was unfair for them to pick who to serve from the black community 
and also from the white. Right. So then they the led our senator uh, introduced the bill to change it from the grand jury method to uh, so electing the school board and member. Who was that? State Senator. Uh, Ronnie Walker. That was Ronnie Walker. Uh, okay. At that time. So he introduced a bill to change it from grand jury selection to, uh, you know, letting the people elect. Mm -hmm. But what happened is that the way he set up the district, we wouldn't have one black serving uh, then. Okay. okay, we had two blacks when they were appointed by right. the grand jury. Right. And the way he set up the district, he put the majority of the blacks in one district and it was impossible anywhere to, in the county to get a second black so then that eliminated one of the blacks that we had and that's out of how many board of education members were there out of so, yeah no they had well, 75 okay whatever okay. okay but anyway so that was his plan was to re that's right so after you know he tried to make us think he was in favor of what we were doing but then in the process he fixed it to eliminate one of the board members, so you know he knew that just having one sitting up there, you know, although the one we had, they weren't doing anything. But in case if we had elected a strong person, we wouldn't have one against right. against five. You understand? So this went on for a while, and this is when I contacted the Justice Department and told them that I thought it was unfair that we had one black that eliminated one of our blacks when they went to the district plan, so then we filed a suit. Under the Voting Rights Act. That's right, through the voters' right uh, to redistrict the Board of Education. Now, how did you, I mean, so how did you get to the Justice Department? I mean, how did you? Oh, I contacted, decided? well, I think Who I called Atlanta, and uh, Mr. Flanagan was serving right. as state president right. at that time. And so, you know, he gave me names that the Justice Department is in contact, okay. and I called, made direct contact. And from there, you know, we started working on it, and through the Justice Department. Okay. So they came down to McCray. That's right. And when they uh, came down and stood the district plans, and that, you know, we would never be able to get another black, at least having two blacks serve. So then this is when we hired attorney Lockie McDonald. Mm -hmm. and, uh, he filed a suit for us through the Justice Department to redistrict the Board of Education. And when they redistrict, then they increased, I believe, to seven. And it might have been seven, I can't okay. remember. But anyway, the way they redistrict, we won the case. And uh, when we had the election, then that put a second district with about 40 some percent blacks. And so when we had uh, the election then, that gave us another black. The black a, a black was elected, mm -hmm. so that gave us two blacks on the board of education. Okay, and that comes down around what time the redistricting of the board? Oh, uh, this must have been. It was in probably about 80, 84, 85. That recently. That's okay, recent. so this one district plan lasted for some time. Then this one member. Yeah, oh, it, it had. It, it gone like for, for quite a while, like you know. For we didn't ten have, years or more. That's right. Yeah. We didn't have one black serve. So I told them that you know, uh, that eliminated one of our blacks by the way they set up the district. So then that's when we went to court to get it redistricted, set up to give a, a larger percentage of blacks in another uh, school board district. Okay. And that resulted in a now it's having two blacks. Okay. And what we're getting ready to tackle now, they have a rule. Well, it, it was uh, approved through the assembly that if a, now I think TFL County is the only county that has this uh, law, that if a vacancy should occur on the Board of Education, and if the, that board member didn't serve one week and, and resign due to death, illness, or for what cause, the board, other board member have a right to appoint who they want to. Okay, the terms are for four years. What if you came in and were elected and you served one week and decided you didn't want to serve? Then the, the school board members and the superintendent go and pick, hand pick who they want to serve out almost four years. That's not right to the voters in that county, but it is the law. Now this is what we finna tackle.
Okay. 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 So I have contacted my uh, representative, so, uh, Terry senator, Coleman, who is this? Terry Coleman, Walter Ray, Paul Branch, Fisher. I have made contact with all of them, and uh, so we're having a meeting with them soon. Well, what and has their response been up to this point? Well, they they understand our problem, and they seen that they are willing to you know try to get it changed so that. All we want them to do is spell out a time limit, like if it's less than a year or less than uh, six months. Right, then it's then election. Then they can appoint, because, you know, it's not, not that much time left. But after that. But, you know, you got, I say, almost four years. Now, this, this has happened to us. And so what our, our superintendent's doing, she's handpicking, handpicking who she wants to serve. Okay, we, now, see, two of the people person that's serving on the board now, they are her choice. She didn't even, we didn't even know it was a vacancy occur. We had one of our board members resign in January. He had three, three uh, about three and a half years left. We didn't know he had resigned. We didn't know that the board had, had picked someone to serve his position. When we found out about it, it had happened about two or three weeks whenever the voters in that district. Okay, now this is a, you know, majority black district. But they didn't tell us that the board member had resigned. They didn't tell us that they had replaced the board member. And that was about three and a half year that term left. And we felt that the voters should have, with that much time left, we should have had a chance to elect who we want to serve, not the superintendent and the board member. So she had picked someone that she knew was going to go along with all her plans that she had. Same thing happened for a white board member. This white board member had about a little bit of three years left. Mm -hmm. He resigned to run for county commissioner seat. Okay. So then she had picked and presented to the board who she wanted to serve his time. So see right now, she has two persons serving on the board of education that she hand picked because she know they're going to go along with all her her plans. And. They're, they are not the voters' choice, but choice, but they are her choice. Okay. So this is what we're going to tackle. Has there ever been a black candidate for school superintendent? No. Is that at all feasible, even? Well, some of them have been talking to me about <laughs> right after I retire. I have one year to retire. Right. That's right. Uh, did you have? I was wondering about that. Did I mean involved with all the school board stuff and you back in the school system? What kind of uh, pressure or whatever did you have as a school employee, you know, in well, all this? Well, I'm all, you know, I'm always uh, being approached by the superintendent of problems that have been involved. So, see, my husband is the branch president. So, you know, I tell you, you know, she's always uh, <laughs> approaching me about certain issues that's being handled through the NAACP then she always pinpoint me because you know she do you know what she told me she told me my husband didn't have enough intelligence and she knew that i had to be the one doing it like uh discrimination and, and complaints about the uh, students and discipline in you know in school among the students or uh, changing grade for white students and giving them grades so that they can finish and what have and they're not doing the same thing for black and so every time some complaints come in from the NAACP, then she always called me in and said, I respond, but she said, my husband didn't have enough intelligence. There was an article in the paper about the school system. My husband signed the article, but she told me he didn't write it because he didn't have enough intelligence to write it. She knew I had to write it, so you didn't see me write it. But see, everything that happens, you know, they always pick up with me. What about the school stuff in particular, you know, the school board election stuff in particular and the suits involving the school board? And did you, have, as a school employee, feel any heat from that? Well, not really, you know. I guess they, they have tried, she has tried everything she could to come up with things of, you know, being in support and what have, but, you know, she really hadn't never been able to get anything that would hold. And Little nitpicking things she comes up with, you know. She probably know that it would be a court case, just like uh, one of our black teachers had problems uh, last year in the school system. The NAACP got involved and saved her job. And then later on, she approached me and told me that 
that the news reporter said that I gave her information about it. So I told her, I said, well, uh, you come to me talk about what the news reporter said. I say, if you don't have my voice on the tape, I said, what the news reporter told you, uh, that's your word against my, against the news reporter word and your word. So I hadn't heard anything as from it. Okay. So well, what how, she is saying that, you know, anything that's happening, we're not supposed to let it go to the press, and, and she just about controlled that because we have had TV people to come down several times for issue that were really involved, and when they came down and they would go back, they couldn't even uh, they couldn't even air it because when they con they when they tried to contact her, she wouldn't talk with them, she wouldn't respond in any manner. So you know that there are some things that you can't print until you get both sides of it. So a lot of the things that go in the school system is not exposed because she won't talk with the news media. I was going to ask how the how the media uh, has how like the local paper has treated all of the voting stuff or all the elections. Well, stuff we don't get do. too we don't get too much from them because I told you it's a small town, it's a political thing. She is such great power. Oh, she had she had people controlled from. McCray to Atlanta and from McCray to I say Brums, news reporters and thing. We can call them to come in. They they tell us they're going to write articles, and we haven't get gotten but a very few to put these articles and things in the paper because they come back and tell us they can't print, but so much because she they didn't get her side and she refused to talk with them. She had the board member. They refuse to talk with them, so you see, it's a lot of stuff going on that the press, you know, they, they told us they couldn't print it. And the local papers, that just out of the question. Right. Because one of the local, local person is on the school board. And I'm telling you what happened in that case. One time he was printing things about the school system, you know, negative things and what have you. Yeah. And so to stop him, one of our school board members, uh, well, they got a law after you stay in two terms, you can't serve anymore. Okay. So, uh, she couldn't she couldn't run again. She had served two terms. So then, they got she got together with this lady, and they encouraged this new this uh, person that owned the local newspaper to run for that board of education seat. Okay, so see by him on the Board of Education now, some of the things that he used to write about the school system, you know. Right, he can't do so that. So she has right. control of that now. Okay. What about elections? What kind of coverage have you got in the papers about about these suits, for instance, voting rights suits? Well, they all came through Macon Telegraph and Atlanta Constitution. Okay. Uh, probably... I think probably one at one time I saw one of the articles in the TFL Enterprise, not the TFL Times. Cause see, the TFL Times, this uh, guy that owns the TFL Times is on the Board of Education, so he won't print anything. But the Enterprise so, did. So there are two newspapers in. There? Yeah, we have two newspapers. Okay. Two That's local papers. Unusual. And uh, but they, she has everybody captured. See. She has a lot of money. Her parents died, and they left her a lot of money. So you know she's rich, and what she's doing is that she has created a lot of position. And some of the whites that she knew was dissatisfied with what she was doing in the school system. She gave them jobs. She gave their friends jobs, their relatives jobs, and so you know it's just a political thing. How long has she been in there? This make her second term. We see what happened. She's so powerful until nobody would ca would uh, qualify against her when time to be elected. And I think one of the reasons under this QBE, she was doing all this consolidation of these schools, closing out these schools. So I don't think nobody wanted to walk in. Because their school might get. That's right, because of all this, this stuff going on, on uh, you know, closing out the schools in the community. So I think nobody really didn't want they go going through a lot of renovation and what have you. And another thing, this is what the whites said, well, why should they qualify? Because when time to have the election, although she has discriminated, 
mistreat a lot of black. But see down there, all you have to do, which I wish us could be done about this, these whites go out and hand out money when time for the election. These blacks will take. I mean, it, what you think would be intelligent blacks? I was going to ask you about vote buying. Tell me how that works. Tell so, fair. this this is the problem. So you know, those whites knew. They said, well, she could go out and put out enough money. They didn't have the money. Some whites that you know would have ran against her. They said they didn't have the money. So they knew she was going to go out and put out get some of these blacks. Uh, to put out money among these blacks and that she would get their votes so they say that they probably wouldn't have a chance to beat them. But I think the whole point was that they just didn't want to go into all this stuff that was going on. You know, she had right. closed down schools in this renovation of QBE and I think that's one reason they didn't have anyone to you know qualify against her. How widespread is vote, vote buying oh, in other races too? You know, not all the Yes, yeah, everything. Even <laughs> it has gotten so wide until we had an election for the NAACP uh, two years ago. And this black guy was out buying votes <laughs> trying to become president of the NAACP. Mm. Now, I wrote a letter to uh, the Secretary of State about we had this uh, election for Board of Commission. And, you know, I don't care if it's black or white. Right. But in vote this buying, district, buying, right. that's right, in this district I'm living in, it was all blacks running against each other. But now the black that intelligent black people felt that would be better to serve us, that person lost out to a lady. You know, she's never been involved in anything in the community. She's never been involved in budgeting or anything. This black guy that was running against her was well, you know, because of he been working on the federal programs and what has so we know he probably knew how to help set up budgets and things like that. And he lost, you know why he lost? Because this lady that won, her boyfriend is a big time dope man, dope racket man. Uh he's a big time gambler. He's one of those professional gamblers. So he had the money. And he went out into the black district and passed out money to those black people and some of the black people that was saying that they were going to vote for and they said that money turned them and she won and now she's sitting up there now we having the biggest uproar down there about property tax we had a meeting Thursday night and I imagine probably over about 200 people met up she voted to increase our taxes and she doesn't even own any property so what did Max Cleland's office say when you wrote him well they went back and they told me to you know get up some information and some of the people that I could get to verify that they uh, was given money or they were offered money. But see, well, you know what would happen in that case? When they find out somebody's going to come down and investigate, they talk, well, I, I don't want to be a part of it. But see, they were going around telling that they had gotten money. And I had one person to say that they were offered money, and that was my son. But see, they wouldn't take just that one, one person. He said he was offered money from this from this guy. Since it was your son. Right? That's right. right. We see there are a lot of other people were talking about it, and we knew that they were passing out money, but you see, just like I said, to have somebody come in and investigate, you got to have some person to be willing to sign a statement to verify that they would be willing to cooperate, but then when it come down to that, you know, to send their names in, and then they would come in and say, well, no, he didn't give me any money, so, you know, okay, the same guy that was some blacks that he carried up there and voted absentee ballots. And the day of the election, they were walking around on the streets in McCray, but that was another thing. So, I really never just sent the information back, but I just been, you know, it's been something like about a month. Okay. About three weeks since I received the complaints back in. Speaking of the Secretary of State's office, what kind of contact have you had with registrars and election officials over the years, either from the state level or local registrars, and what has their response been to black voters and black uh, registrants and so forth in terms of... Well, we call them concerning uh, the blacks that they handpick to serve as on the board of registrar. But they said it was left up on a local level. See, what they do, they go out, they got two blacks on the board of registrar. I think three blacks mm -hmm. out of probably nine. Mm -hmm. 
but they handpick them. Okay, they are blacks that they are not going to be concerned about the black people. Just like whenever this uh, they had to have this election for board of commission that we just won, they had to send letters to every voter in that would be involved. And you know what happened? I went up to the registrar's office and you know to let them know what district they were in. Cause see, some of them. When we uh, won this election, you know, some of them didn't have the, they weren't in the same, they weren't in the same districts or something. So they were supposed to send everybody a letter. Mm -hmm. When also when we had this new uh, won this case to uh, redistrict the board of education, and this election was held. Okay, those two new uh, districts that were set up, they were supposed to have sent a letter to all the voters and verify that and verify as to what district that they would be serving the education district. I went up to the uh, registrar's office that day. She had about a hundred letters up there on her desk return, and that was like about a week for the election. So I said, "Why do you have all?" She said, "I wasn't supposed to see that." I said, "Why do you have all these letters up here returned because of incorrect right, address?" Right. She said. Uh, well, we mail them out and they send them back. I said, well, you see, a lot of those people, I knew, you know, because I know a lot of those black people. So I said, well, what are you going to do to try to get the letters to them to let them know what education district they'll be voting in? Well, there's nothing I can do. The letters came back. I said, you don't have that address in your file up there. And she said, well, uh, uh, yeah, I guess. I said, well, you let me look in your file. And I went there and pulled, started pulling out there. I said, here's this man's address. I said, it's correct. I know his address. I said, this person. And uh, she said, well, you know, I had someone else helping me. Now, this was a white lady. She had another white lady helping her. But then I asked her about it. I said, well, where are the two black people that on the board with you? I said, right. why don't you have them to come in and verify? Like she might have put their address on there. But they might have lived in Loma City, and she put them a cray address. They weren't intent for them to get those letters. So then I said, well, what are you going to do about getting these letters to these people? I said, I'm going to call the Justice Department. She got in her car, and they went out and went to hand and delivered those letters. But you see, that was just a week before the election. And it was only chance that you happened to be... That's right. If I hadn't gone in. See, that was, about, that was about 100 voters that would not have gotten that letter. And do you know where they lived? They lived in this in this new district that they that they created, about 43% black. No, it was for, no, it was for about 49% black. Okay. So you see, that was the reason to make sure that no black got elected to the Board of From Education out of that district. So we have two blacks on there, but, you know, they were handpicked. And they are not concerned about these black people uh, being notified of their new districts and what have you. Uh, they are not concerned about them being notified when they, uh, you know how they take, go back and uh, take the voters' names off the list after they purge have, them, right? yeah, yeah. Purge after they have them voting so long. Well, see, they are not concerned. And they, see, so, so the whites sit up there and take these black people names off and, uh, you know, and none of the black people that serve them, they don't go up there to try to see. Uh, right, so they're, you're saying they kind of do the minimum without really doing outreach and keeping that's things right. up and making we sure that see every time, and every time their times are up, they will go back and reappoint. So it's a self perpetuate and the board selects itself, is that how it works, or how does I think the board, the board submit to the judge the judge, okay. To the judge who they want to serve. And so the, if the board submit those names, then the judge go along with it. Because, Automatically. Yeah. That's right, because we submitted some names to the judge. You know, they were just ignored. Some blacks that we wanted to be placed on the board of register, on the jury commission. We sent some names in, but our name was just totally discarded because the judge said that he goes by what the... Uh, the uh, superior court judge, and I mean the clerk of court submits for the jury commission, and when and the person that the board of registrar can uh, submit to the judge, that's who the judge act on. So you know they, we don't have any say there. And I'm thinking about if there's any way to try to file a suit to stop that. 
You know, I don't, I don't know if we're gonna have, get there. Have there been any suits about border registers? Uh, I don't know. I don't know, but I'm thinking about it because see, just like I said that, I told her so she said, "Well, who who do y'all want?" I said, "I'm interested in sir." But two months ago, they appointed the same two black ladies sir, and I told her I was interested in sir. But you see, they have the choice to pick who mm -hmm. they want to serve. So That's see, they don't want me on there because they know probably the little old, little small things, the irregularities that they are doing that I would detect and so they don't want me on there. What about places to register over the years? Uh, I mean, we've been talking about voting and the board of registers. What about where people could register? I mean, you were saying well, it used to be just the courthouse. Everybody had to go to the courthouse, but now we finally went up there and worked, talked with them at the courthouse. I think we might have talked with the grand jury about that. And they uh, decide to let uh, uh, vote. I mean, a registration place be set up in each little city in Tefal, like Lawrence City, Jacksonville, Mile, and uh, Helena come to McCray because right. I think no, Helena has, has its own place okay. for registering. Just right next door. That's right. right. What about um, hours of registration? Well. They are from 9 to 5, uh, nine to 4.30. And a lot of people working at 9 o'clock, a lot of them have not gotten home at 5, at 4.30. So we we met with the uh, with the jury commission about that. No, the, the uh, chief registrar about that. And some of the places that we submitted to have uh, on site registration or special registration drive you know places uh most of the places that we submitted they find other places to do it like you know we submitted at the black funeral home that's a public place uh we wanted at this middle school at long then it was the middle school mm -hmm. up the street not too far from where i live that's a public building and uh we solicited uh where's one other place but the place that we submitted you know i guess it left up to the board of registrar they didn't use those places they are uh, they so they are uh, let me see picked the church or one of the black board person serving on the board the church of the other black board member and i think they got the shopping center but see, what I'm trying to say is that both of those churches, you don't have very many people going to those churches. You know, they saw the up-class people. And so they just don't have many people coming to that church. And we was trying to pick some places where it was convenient and that we could get probably, you know, a church with a large attendance and we could get a lot of people registered there. But now they wouldn't use those places. Okay. They just go to the places with smaller attendance and more up, upper class. That's right, upper class that that weren't encouraging and they weren't concerned about those people becoming registered voters. So you know this is a problem we're having. Okay. Now the school board, the board of education, that was the first effort you're saying, and that was mainly by chance because this bond referendum was coming up, and you, that was used as a lever to That's get right. two new board members even though they were hand-picked uh, when did you start to move or maybe you could tell me about city council sort of the efforts to oh, deal with we, the city council over we started on the city council in McCray it, it was in 80 I can't think of what whatever you, yeah okay. um, but we contacted the Justice Department there and so what happened they sell all that they didn't want us to bring a suit we contacted the Justice Department about breaking the city up into up into wars and uh, so we could get some blacks on the city council because we had had blacks had been run over the years, right. but it was at large, and they could never get enough votes to uh, be elected. Now the city of McCray is what percentage black? Um, I really is it half? Is it the majority? Or it's just about. It's about half. Just okay. about half. But we could never get blacks elected. So when they find out that we were getting ready to brain file a suit to have it broken up into war, then they decided to go ahead on themselves and, and agree. So they broke it up and they have one uh, black district, majority black district, well, it's not about four or five whites in the district. 
Okay. And from that war, we have, we always a guarantee, you know, two blacks coming out of that war. So they have two blacks and five whites on the city council. But now, does that mean that the uh, whites don't even have to campaign in the black districts? And they no. don't, they're not accountable then, right? No. They don't have to come over and out this campaign. So they... Well, now, nah. hold it. I think you might have... You have a few handful of blacks in one of the... Okay. In one of the... But they don't even have... They don't have to come over there because they are most in the majority white district. They have to go among the whites. And our two black city council members, they have to deal with just blacks when they are running for that right. position. Right, so the whites still are not accountable politically to the black community no, at all. No, no, because they, they don't, they need, don't, do they they don't, don't campaign, campaign in the black community. No, really, they don't, they don't really little... need to because they only have a small percentage of blacks in any of those white war. But you have a, and then out of a black war, you only have black about, I don't even think we have any whites. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so the blacks have to go among the blacks to get their, their votes. And the whites, there may be just a, a small percentage of blacks that's in those wars. Okay, okay. So I just was wondering, so there's never an opportunity where a white candidate, say, would speak at a black church or anything like that? It would no, be, they don't have to because they, know, they to. know that they're not the few blacks that are in that war. You know, they're really not going to need their votes. So, you know. Okay. So, did, was this the first... We, the first actual suit was the uh, Board of Education, That's right? That's right. And then the the city council was just a threatened That's suit. That's right. And, they, and then we came back and redistricted the Board of Education. Right. Okay. See, we filed a suit first to... Get rid well, of the grand well, jury. Well, we... That's right, to get rid of the grand jury selection and, uh, and uh, go to the... Uh, go to the district plan. But see, that didn't work. So then we came back and we started working on the city, but they made an agreement, so then we came back and filed a suit to redistrict the Board of Education, which would give us a better chance of getting at least two blacks on the board. Mm -hmm. Now, on the city council, um, tell me a little bit more about those negotiations to, 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 to have the two and the five. I mean, is that more or less what you had wanted, or did, you know? Well, not really, but we were, at the time, we were just interested in getting some blacks on the city council. We knew that they were, this would be the only way that they would be elected. So this is the plan that they drew up. And seeing the plan that they have drawn up now, we would never be able to get but two blacks on the city council. Right, right, no matter what. No matter what, the only way that we can get a possible out of seven or another black is that we're gonna have to go back and redistrict. What about the census or reapportionment i mean is that at all a possibility to use as a sort of a lever to get another well no because what's happening on the census i was talking with uh reverend thurman over yeah, there yeah. a few minutes ago uh they uh they have most whites hired to go around and take these addresses right now there were some blacks that passed the test right okay so to see our superintendent and the mayor the superintendent runs the school system in the county, and he's in charge of the city of McCray. Well, you know, so he has all the other mayors under his thumb in the other little towns in right. TFA. So they tell him who to hire, who not to hire, and what to do. And uh, so when it took the census test, we had some blacks that passed the test. Okay, but they never gave them a chance to work. And if you wanted to be hired, you had to go up to the city hall. They started out at the community center. So the next thing we knew was at the city hall, and they had this article in the paper and on the radio, if you was interested in part-time work taking census. But then some of the people that had passed the test went up, and because they weren't the right blacks, they didn't get hired. So they had most of the whites working, and you know how it is. Some of those whites not going to go into some of those black neighborhoods. That's right. Now you know, because you know some of them, I would be skeptical about going into some of those blacks said, you know some of those white whites not gonna go in those sections. So uh what happened is that there's gonna be a lot of blacks gonna be left out. I was just telling her not to take any towels. Uh -huh. we're fine here. Um uh-huh. 
so so people are gonna get left out on the census too. That's right. Okay. When did you start to attack the one man commission? Tell me about that story. Oh, well, we just had one man run the county. He was doing what he wanted to do, and I just felt that some of the decisions he was making, you know, they weren't good, and no blacks ever had any say so, and I felt that the only way that we could could get some blacks involved, uh, you know, and but not only blacks, but I just feel it should be more than one man in in charge of determine how all the county operations and what have you would take place. So I became interested. And I was going to sign the paper, but Attorney Lockett McDonald said, since you're working in the school system, don't you be the plaintiff. <laughs> but you know, it really didn't matter to me because, you know, I was just at the point that I wanted to see a change made. And your daughter was the plaintiff, right? So then my daughter signed. Cheryl, right? Yeah, Cheryl yeah. Clark. My daughter signed and my nephew well, I, that's when I read Kirk Pays. Uh, and we had uh, another guy, two other guys to sign. And that's how it took place. And what was the basis of the suit? I mean, what, on what grounds did you try to challenge the one man commission? Well, we challenged because we said it was unfair that blacks would never get a chance to serve on the county kind of commission. That the one. That one they, member, stayed, sole commissioner, one member, that's right, guaranteed because, that it would be white. That's right. So that was one of our bases that okay. we you know, filed on that a black would never be elected to serve as commissioner. And I gather that this was the first successful suit of this type that the ACLU had won right. challenging the county commission. That's right. It was decided in Augusta, is that right? Uh, that's yeah. And you went, well, you were there at the hearings and so forth? Well, my daughter was at the hearings. Oh, hearing. that's right. She was so, the you know, after they, after they signed, then I told them that, you know, to use my daughter as the lead plaintiff because there were going to be a lot of contact was going to have to be made. And one or two of the other guys that signed, you know, they probably wouldn't know what type of respond to give back when they needed it, so I told them, you know, they really needed somebody that would understand and, uh, you know, could be handed to get in contact with. So what was she doing? What kind of work was she doing? Uh, she's a teacher. She's a she, teacher too. She doesn't teach in Tampa. Okay. Got it. Okay. <laughs> she's teaching in Macon. Okay. Okay. Uh, and then after that court decision, which was, I guess, just last year, uh, what right. I saw in the paper that the county officials had 90 days to set up a government plan consisting of a multi-member commission and single district and so forth. Tell me what has happened at the county level since that time. Well, we had, uh, you know, we had an election and we Did it guarantee how many black out of how many? Well, now the way that the procedure was set up, we had a chance to get three blacks on there. Out of? Out of five. Out of five, okay. I'm going to tell you what happened now. In Lumber City, it's 39% black. Okay. The popul I mean, the voters now, it's 39% okay. black population that grew. Okay. We had four white men that qualified, but we couldn't get not one black to qualify. If that one black had just qualified, and you know how how, vote. how to get people do about this vote, you know, the blacks going to vote for that mm -hmm. color and the whites going to vote for theirs, you know. Because you're not going to have a whole lot of, well, in some cases you have some white people. Crossover, play. right. But uh, it's a racial line thing. So if we could just have gotten one black to qualify down in Loma City, we could have had a black, we could have had two blacks on the board. And what was the problem? Well, it was sort of confusing. One black was supposed to have qualified, and then some of them want that black to qualify, so they had picked another black, and at the last minute, all so there were three blacks that were supposed to qualify. At the last minute, didn't any of them go up and qualify. So that left all whites in the race. But I believe that if one of them had qualified, and you know, and with three, no, with four whites, with four whites in that race and one black, if just those thirty-nine percent black had voted for that black man, you know, he would have had the plurality. The that's most right. Votes. He would have had most votes. But you know, didn't no blacks run? Okay, the same thing happened out in Jacksonville area. There were several whites in the district in Jacksonville. That district is 32% black. Okay. Now we had seven whites that qualified for that district. One black, but I'll tell you what happened in that case. The blacks didn't like the black man that was running, so they split their votes up among the whites. 
and that's how that how that black law stopped. But I have 32 percent black out in that area, and you know, I'm just saying that if they had voted for him, he would have won. That's right. But see, when he qualified, there was some of the other blacks didn't like him, so you know they supported some of the white candidates. What other kind of obstacles exist for black candidates to run these days? You know, what, why, why are the difficulties in getting people to actually well, qualify they for have, office? Well, it has been instilled in them all their lives that they weren't supposed to run for office. They were supposed to, you know, support the white candidates. And, you know, this has been instilled in a lot of blacks, and this is why they won't qualify. You know, there's, some of them will say, well, you blacks not going to vote for me anyway. You're going to vote for that white man. And then some of them say, well, I know no whites are going to vote for them. I'm going to need their vote. But they, how do they know? They need to go out and campaign among the whites. What about filing fees and things like that? Well, this is another problem. You know, how black people want something for nothing. They uh, go out and waste money. That's their business and a lot of other things. But they want someone to pay their qualified fee. And like we have limited funds in our branch, so we couldn't pay it. And then some of them, they came up and said, at the last minute, we said, well, why didn't you tell us that we would have tried to, you know, get out and solicit the money? But now that's another problem. Blacks do not want to pay for what they want to serve for. You know, they don't want, they don't want to pay the cost. So this is another thing that kept some blacks from qualifying because I think it was I don't know if it was a hundred or something dollars they had to pay qualifying fee. I can't remember. But it wasn't a whole lot, but now that's what some of them used. Uh-huh. Hold on. So said basically as far as the city goes, it's a pretty segregated situation. Blacks vote for, blacks that's black right. candidates are elected by blacks, white candidates are elected by whites. Is that the same on the county level too now? Or is there are there episodes where No I guess not, because you've not. been telling Oh, but one one of the seats is majority black. One of the seats is uh, 80, about 85, uh, so I think about 80 some percent black. At the county level though, whites might have to seek black votes or blacks might have to seek, I mean, you know. Well, whites will have to seek some black votes. Right. But the district that I'm in is 80, I think it's about 85 percent black. Uh, not let you know you got a real strong white in there. Are they able right. to come in and buy votes? You but don't I, have too many blacks that will have to go. But you're to saying white. Lumber City, for instance, is a more open kind of. Uh, yes. Now whites have to go to those blacks there. All the blacks will have to go to the whites in Lumber City. Now, the one thing I'm interested in is, you know, again, a black church might open up for a white candidate in, say, Lumber City, but would the white church do the same for a black candidate? No. No, they would. I don't imagine they would open it for a white either. You know, this is. I'm just talking about uh, access. You know that. Yeah. Uh, uh, in a situation like Lumber. But now, what we do when we have our meeting, we have some like a political forum. Mm -hmm. and this we is the, invite the all branch the you're talking about. That's yeah. right. Uh huh. That's our political action part of our branch. We have a political forum, and we invite all the candidates, black and white. And back then, when we didn't have no blacks qualified for anything, you know, we were, we, we didn't have no choice but to pick from whites, so we would invite all the whites, we, right. no matter how many were running, we invite, we gave everybody a chance to come in and give that little platform. Okay. Now, again, in a place like Lumber City, where there's no clear, you know, dominance of one race over the other in terms of population, what obstacles does a black candidate have compared to a white candidate? Or what well, the only thing down there is that most of the blacks down there are controlled by one white man. Who they work for? Or what? Yes, he works a large percentage of those black people. If he doesn't work them, they live on his land. He has a large trailer park. Okay. And a lot of black people didn't have land, so they have their trailers on his land. And he controlled, he, he has something like probably a hundred and a total of a uh, number person, probably 150 or more living out there oh, in this trailer park. Okay, okay he, he owns a liquor store. He let those black people have liquor on credit and they pay him on, when they, someone get paid on Friday evening, all that paycheck go to him, the majority of it. And so he controls 
the black people and he tells them that was one thing you didn't, couldn't get in the blacks to qualify. So he sort of tell the blacks, you know, not to, because he qualified. So the blacks were supposed to have supported him. Okay. But, but he, he, he was in the runoff, but he lost in the, in the runoff. That's what happened. So that's why that's really why we can get the blacks to qualify. I've got to tell you that because he controlled the blacks, so he was running. So he told the blacks not to qualify. And at present, we have a suit against Lama City to break it up into wars. Okay. And we won that suit, but the Justice Department is uh, they won't pre-clear it because of uh, some things that they think is not going to work, like they're going to pick so many uh, city council members from this ward and so many from that ward and we'll have I think about two or three at large and the Justice Department doesn't think that's going to work so this is what they holding off on now okay. uh, pre, you know, pre-clearing okay okay what other kinds of uh, obstacles can you see still remain for black people to have sort of equal access to politics and the political process right now we talked about a fair number of that range of uh, board of registration. Well, I think the, the, the thing that will happen now is that you still will have these whites that will have control of, I say, weak mind black people. Still telling them that they don't need to hold office in, you know, they don't need to be a part of the governing board or they don't need to hold office. And so this is about the only thing I know. So, you know, they're threatening them with their jobs. See, just like at some of these plants and what have you. Uh, complaints have been brought against the school system. Some of the people that were involved, you know, it's a power structure thing. You know, you contact the head of the this uh, company and that company, and then they'll find something or just come in and just anything that people know they're late, they'll be laid off. So some of them are afraid to get involved because of, you know, their jobs. And you're saying that still goes on? Still goes on, and it's getting getting back strong. One time it was sort of, you know, God. it was limited, but now... Uh, like what, for instances, have you heard? Well, it seems like since uh, they made this, uh, the Supreme Court made this a ruling about affirmative action, <laughs> job discrimination, and what have you, you know. Original uh, case, yeah. It looked like it's just really big beginning to just really open up now, uh, in, especially in Telfair County. I and mean, what kind of specifics are you talking about in Telfair? Well, when it comes down to, uh, I'll say, you know, getting jobs, you know, just like jobs that they have here had blacks being held in, you know, they are no longer doing it. It looks like they're laying them off and they're not putting them back to work okay. in those positions and what have you. Okay. Uh, the picture you're painting is a pretty... Uh, bleak one, really. I mean, you know, uh, uh, I mean, you're talking a lot about how there still are real barriers to equal access in the political process. That's right. Uh, let me flip the coin and say what changes have taken place as a result of um, black involvement, increased black involvement over the last 25 years in, in, in the political process in Telfair? Well, I think it has helped in easing some of the tension on the Board of Education until she handpicked, you know... This new interim... Yes, right, as to who she wanted to serve. And we have had better results, like in uh, blacks getting jobs and what have you. County jobs, you That's right, about. county jobs and what have you. City jobs, yeah. Uh -huh. At what levels? I mean, are there clerical workers now? Well, are yes, there... we were able to get... Uh, um, blacks in the city hall, and uh, because you know we had black city council members, where we talked to them, we told them that you up there to represent us, and these are things that you need to take back. That's the question as to why. And I think we get improvement, like over in the black community, as far as uh, uh, improving the status of the community, roads, sewage, and stuff like that. Um, at the now since our superintendent been in, she has eliminated blacks in position. But like you know, the banks have hired like right. all the banks have hired black people. 
and uh, well, you know, we had meetings with them. We didn't have any problems. Okay. Where do you see sort of the next frontier being? The sort of the next areas of battle, or you know, the sort of the next things to move on. Well, I think what we are going to battle with now is, and we may can't do anything about that, the problem of housing. Well, you see, you have these, you know, you have a white that's over these projects and what have you, and these public housing. And when certain people go in and apply, they have vacancies and what have you. But, see, like I said, the mayor knows everybody. So then, you know, they, they have to go through the mayor or the superintendent, and she tells them, like, you know, who to let live in these high, public housing projects and who not to. Uh, some of them have carried their verification papers back and of their salaries and what have you. They have openings, and then all of a sudden they come and tell them they don't have openings. Or they tell them they went through the credit bureau and they had bad credit rating. So, you, we have a problem now with housing there, and I'm just wondering if they are being fair. Okay, how do you affect that black. through the political process, though? Huh? How do you get at that through elections and politics? Well, why I think that it's a part of it because, you know, there are certain people that they let come in and certain people they don't. And so... Uh, mm -hmm. That's why. Now, is there any possi Is the mayor elected citywide? Oh, yes. Okay. Is there any possibility of black mayor ever? Well, we're going to we're going to try to work on him. But you see, the problem is, is that they have money, and the other white candidates. I mean, some white candidates that we feel would be fair to white to blacks. Mm -hmm. You can't get them to run because, or they said they're wasting their time because then what happened is that the few blacks are that's trying to help the cause of blacks. These lower income or so a lower social group blacks will take money when election comes and that put these same people back in. Then once they get back in, they have paid you so you know they don't owe us anything. And they treat us like they want to. And all they'll say, well that's that bureau they're causing trouble. <laughs> so the more moderate whites then say there's no point of us running because we don't pay off the voters. That's right, because they don't believe in doing it illegal. They believe in being elected fair. Right, right. And so, see, those are the kind of whites that we uh, that we support, and we just never had no black to. Yes, we had one black to run. No. No, we haven't had no blacks to run for mayor. mayor really. Right. No. But, mm. so the vote buying is a real important thing to try to. That's to deal right. With. Well, I appreciate this very much. I've learned okay. a lot, and I uh, thank you very, very All much right, for this. All right, anytime you want to talk, just get in contact. And